So I confess to knowing absolutely nothing about smart cities. So I, that's my confession. So the first question to anyone is, can you just describe to us what a smart city is? So, Mateo, you're closest to me, and, uh, and I've got a beer, so you're first. Okay, so, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, the first point I'd like to make is that, in my opinion, actually, in the opinion of the people who build smart cities, that the first priority for a smart city is to improve the citizen's life. So, to do that, they try to create new services that will help the, the people of the city in order to better manage their time, their resources, etc. So, at the moment, the main problem that I see in a, in a smart city, beside the security point of view, is that all different sectors inside the smart city works mostly on their own. So. For example, uh, to, to create, to make an example, Mark, you are from UK, unfortunately, so you don't know how much. Unfortunately, much oh, about, about one my is. God, this is an Italian making a joke about a Brit. This is not going to work well, Matteo. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah. but even if you are from UK, I, heard, I read in your, in your biography that you spent uh, some time in France. Yep. So you may have learned something about wines. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about wines when okay. I lived in France, Perfect. let me tell you. So, like in winemaking, when you have to make a wine, there are different actors in the, in the process, like in a smart city, but all these actors, usually when, you, when you're speaking from a single vineyard or a single canteen, they all try to create the same product. So they all are agree on some specific things on their product, and they are all try to follow this guideline. Okay, so that's what I think is going to happen for a smart city. And another thing that I'd like to highlight, that in my opinion, is going to happen very soon, is that we, have, we are going to have intercommunication between three main actors. The first one is the physical layer, so the sensor and all the stuff that are placed inside the city. So we can control traffic, we can control weather, we can control energy consume, con consume uh, and all this kind of stuff. And the second, the second actor, the second layer, is the logic layer, that is something that usually, in my opinion, is built by some vendor and implemented by the city itself. So there should be one actor that control the different system or at least try to make those systems communicate with each other properly. And then we have the third actor that uh, in my previous research I never considered, but now I'm seeing that is more, more important, and is the what I call the cloud layer or the service layer. That is the integration of known service that the users already are using, like for example, Google services, Apple services, and we can see that is happening already, maybe in a smaller size, like for example IoT. So Apple has, for example, HomeKit or whatever is the name, that you can allow you to interface with sensor and system inside your home to control them. And for example, another example I'd like to, to point is, I don't know how many of you know about the, what's the name, I, I wrote them down because I'm very bad with names, is uh, Google flew trends. So basically, Google made an experiment that uh, with, is starting uh, reading the research of the users, try to understand when there is a, a flu epidemic, when the flu epidemic starts. Like every year, there is a flu epidemic. And they did this experiment in the UK. And they were able to understand that there is a flu epidemic five days before the national sanitary system in the UK. So I'm thinking that government and cities will try to use the power and the knowledge of third-party services or third-party corporation in order to implement this third communication layer within the sensor and their actual actuators and stuff inside the city. Okay, so let me, let me, let me, let me halt because again, I know nothing about smart cities, so I'm trying to, trying to understand that might be useful. So if I understand what you're saying, it's a combination of sensors that can tell about where people go within the cities. Yeah, it's where the connected, go, where people want to okay, go, connected, where connected spend services time. and connected data between all those things. Yeah. And that is both public data and private data. So it's a, is it a partnership between the both pr public companies and private, or the public sector and the private sector? Yeah, that's what, in my opinion, is going to be okay. when we reach a mature status for smart city. Okay. And, and then what, bef before we go to Eddie, because I want to ask the question of like, what's the, you know, what do you think is the biggest problem in that? What's the model smart city in the world right now? Like what, if you if if someone says like that is the best that's the most advanced smart city at the moment yeah at the moment because I can tell you it's not San Francisco where I live 
<laughs> it's like the most backward place but at the in moment the world. I, I see the most uh, advancing uh, probably Dubai and Singapore as well um, in Europe I don't know much but Barcelona okay Italy not <laughs> yeah San Francisco definitely not. okay right okay great but, okay, so one comment. there is a lot of also of marketing behind the, the smart city concept because many many cities are saying okay we are the smartest city in the world but when you go there it's just using some interesting technology but it's not like they already have everything uh, backed up by new technology and system so we are like an early stage right now so what makes what makes dubai and barcelona are so advanced then what what's the technology because that they are using? taking the lead uh, thinking about you know the, the new technology how to properly implement it making some investment already have some solutions um, but it's not like everything is automated everything is, is new Okay. Yeah, I mean, part of, part of it is that uh, you have to think of a smart city as a as an ecosystem where uh, you know, think of it as like a body. Where if you were to design a body and say, now I want to connect all these pieces so there's a living, breathing organism, that's what you're essentially building with a smart city. So, you know, imagine where uh, you know again, I know this is simplistic, but the roads are arteries and so on. And now you want to create a better flow. Uh, you know, today the roads are terrible in a lot of cities. Traffic, you know, clogs up in Dubai. You know, I live in Abu Dhabi in Dubai. There's a lot of traffic at different times of day. Uh, you know, with self-driving vehicles and with the sensor grid and so on. You know, the idea would be that it's a self-healing environment over time. I mean, this is going to take time, but it's the orchestration of the sensors and the signaling and then the vehicles that ultimately lead to better outcome. And there's a lot of modeling done around it and so on. And then it's obviously orchestration of greater systems that, you know, then interrelate to one another. So, uh, you know, where the power system and the, you know, law enforcement system, for example, and healthcare systems and so on are all have interrelationships. And as you can imagine, as you start creating more and more of those ecosystem based relationships, the idea of a total system failure, uh, you know, can be really problematic. As uh, any of you have seen Die Hard 4 or any of these kinds of movies, uh, you know, the, these kinds of problems exist, particularly where the underpinnings are uh, hardware and software, uh, IoT-based environments that, you know, have 1990-0 vulnerabilities and so on. So I was going to say, so I'm assuming this is like the city of the future, I'm imagining in my head, right? The Jetsons, like riding on the thing. I imagine this is built on the latest and greatest, right? Correct assumption? Well, you know, it, it may very well be the technology that came out yesterday, but as many of you know that, you know, do research, uh, it's the technology that came out yesterday that has the 1990-0 web server built into it with... Uh, you know, the same vulnerabilities that we patched 20 years ago that are unpatched or unupdatable hardware, uh, you know, unupdatable software, uh, you know, lots of, of these types of problems. And, and so uh, part of the things that many of us are working on is, you know, how do we create systems of systems? How do we create ultimate owners? Similar to the way Tesla has created, you know, taken ownership of the systems in the vehicle. And so there's lots to discuss in this, in this area. Okay. So if you had to, so you're sitting with a newbie like me, what is the single most important thing about security in a smart city today? Well, I think one of the main problems is that the attack surface is growing every day. And why is that? Because governments are purchasing new technology and deploying it without any security testing. They are blindly trusting the vendors. So if a vendor say we implement encryption, we have authentication, blah, blah, blah. Government basically blindly trust them, acquire technology, deploy it, deploy it start to using it. Um, there is no security testing on any stage. They do a lot of testing for functionality. They compare providers, vendor solution to see what fit better, uh, but there is no security testing. Um, what I hear is that sometimes they use a questionnaire where they ask the vendors if they have enough security, the vendor will have to tick yes or no, but it doesn't matter what the vendor say because no one will test that before that, after that. And then I heard that some cities are partners, have partnership with universities to audit the, the system, the devices, 
but that doesn't scale. And also the work is being done by students or PhD candidate, whatever, and they don't have any real life experience hacking sometimes. Um, and it doesn't scale well because we have a, a lot of new technology coming out every, every week and it's difficult to keep up with everything. So that's, I think that's the main problem to how to find a way to, every time a government is going to acquire new technology to make sure that the technology is secure and ready to be deployed and won't be hacked next day. Okay, Mateo, yeah. same question. One of the problems that uh, in my experience is uh, very important, at least in Italy, is that since the government is not replacing existing technology, and since ex existing technology maybe be like 40 years old or 50 years old, for example, we used to, as, a, as an example the train station or the, the railway or the uh, street, or street traffic. Uh, so they buy new technology and one of the requirements for these new technologies is that the technology must be retrocompatible with the, the existing sensor, the existing system in, in place. So that means that you have to be in somehow, some way vulnerable to problems that we may have solved, like Eddie said, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because they have to take in account sensor that is still vulnerable to the same problems. But until now, those sensors, those actuators, those systems were offline, were not connected to the cloud system of the city, were not interconnecting to other uh, ecosystem of the city. For example, the traffic sensor was on its own. Now the traffic sensors are connected to the police station, or the traffic sensors are connecting to the medical station, so the ambulance can find a better way to go to the hospital. So since now all the sensors must be connecting one another, they also have problems that are available to exploit from other systems, so maybe an attacker can hack the medical system and therefore access to the traffic system and therefore access to the police system and so on and so on and so on. And as, as Caesar said, these things is growing up every day, so it's very difficult now to understand if I hack from one of the systems where I can reach, where, I, where there is something that can stop me. So that, that's another problem that we face in the, in, in the past. Yeah, so, so you raise a really good point. I mean, you know, there's a number of dimensions to this. Um, let's just take, for example, the uh, just understanding the potential resilience of a smart city. Uh, you know, you've got to first of all look at the entities that are involved in this. If you look at at any city, right, their their intent is good, right? I mean, they want to low in, lower carbon emissions, lower the the costs, lower the tax burden. Uh, you know, th these are all good initiatives, right? But, but you know, there's a lot of entities that have never really worked together in terms of orchestrating, you know, the different, uh, you know, interdependencies. So you have to profile the entities, you have to profile where they are from a technology perspective, you have to profile the services that each entity is bringing to the table and where those services are uh, from a contributory perspective. What data are they contributing? What networking? they're contributing and so on, then you have to model that. Uh, you know, and, and just in that work, there's a lot of complexity that many of us in cyber really have never dealt with, you know, uh, you know, just in terms of understanding that. And then if you think about it in terms of impact, let's just take the power grid as an example. So suppose uh, the power grid had a reduced capacity because of some cyber event. So you know, suppose half of the power generating capacity went out. Uh, now you think of all these interdependencies where you have the ability uh, normally to supply power to a hospital, to the financial services organizations, to those that do, um, uh, you know, uh, cleaning water for, you know, a place like the UAE and so on. How do you apportion power in that situation? Well, you might say, oh, well, you know, we'll give it to the hospital first. Well, the hospital might have a generator that would run for two weeks, so you don't have to give it to them. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, thinking that has to go into this. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's a many-to-many -many relationship. And each entity in each service has a many-to-many -many interdependency that's complex. And then when you start adding threat modeling to that and attack scenarios where you don't really have 100-year data, you have to do a lot of math that is uh, uh, you know, that has randomness in it, you know, Monte Carlo simulation, stochastic approaches. So th there's a lot in, that we as, as security people have never really looked at. And that's just on the side of just trying to figure out 
what this could look at. And we, we haven't even talked about some of the stuff that, that is done on, you know, what you do, for example, says so on the side of uh, testing for vulnerabilities and all of this, you yeah. know. So, so, so uh, you, you kind of maybe think about uh, privacy, right? So I'd imagine there's huge privacy implications of this. So I'm thinking about the, the, the horrible attacks that happened in Barcelona last week. I was in Barcelona. We're walking down that street three weeks ago. And it took several days to figure out where that van had gone after the event. Now, if that had been in London, there are cameras absolutely everywhere. And within 30 minutes, they would have figured out exactly where that van went. There's clear privacy implications between those two things and who has access to that data in the right way. But if I'm understanding correctly, in a smart city, you know exactly where someone's gone. You know exactly where they are. There's a whole set of privacy things. How do people think about that in the context of a smart city? Yeah, I think it's always like a cost-benefit equation. Right? People have to, uh, to give some privacy away to be more secure, right? Because you have cameras on the street that help to, for, you know, for traffic, help to prevent crime. But okay, people will know that you will walk in at some street at some time. But I, I can accept that. So I think it, it would take some time to people to understand and, and also not be extremist about privacy because there is some movement around, okay, I, I need 100% privacy, but that's not even possible to do. So people need to understand that they have to to give away a little bit of privacy to have a better life, to be more secure in general. And, and that's our discussion that had to be, uh, that, that should take place sometimes and have to be some regulation and, and some law related with that because also there is the possibility to abuse by the ones that are in charge of the technology. Because you, you could have an operation uh, sorry, uh, an operator that have access to the system, can see the cameras, can read the sensors, can see a lot of information that that information should be protected, but it should be uh, only used for the, the intended use, not for something else. And I think right now there is little control about what governments or cities are allowed to do or not with that information, right? Right. But if you, if an individual participates in a smart city, the choice of whether they use or whether they give up their privacy, if, if they get to choose that, the whole, the whole concept fails, right, doesn't it? So, like, it's a, non, a, a non-issue, isn't it, in that sense? Like, 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 like one, once that data is there, like, if, 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 I'm, if I'm tracked on the metro and someone knows where I am, someone knows who sold me the card, at that point, like, you can't have an optional, optional opt-in to that thing, right? Whereas you can kind of online, right? You can decide to opt into tracking and all of these things, but that system kind of fails, doesn't it? Well, I think that that's one of the main issue and why that means that security must take in account. Because I, I, can, I don't opt in for, for this privacy regulation. I mean, I live in the city, I automatically opt in. So that means that I, in, in, in exchange, I want to be sure that the information that I'm giving away are in somehow protected. And I think like, we mostly speak to, to InfoSec people, so they are by default, by definition, susceptible to privacy issues. But when you speak to normal people, sorry for me, normal <laughs> people, uh, but anyway, when you speak with the yeah. people outside the InfoSec community, um, we give away our privacy every day. I mean, I use uh, G- G- Gmail for, for emailing, and it automatically adds me like my travel information in a proper manner, so it's very easy for me to, to get this information. That means that Gmail is reading my mail, parsing it, and adding in a, some database with my travel information. And the same happens with appointment or the automatic reply function of Gmail. So you, you, you made the example of the security for, for Barcelona, right? But there are much more uh, common example in terms of usability and making the life of the people easier mm-hmm. or more more, yeah, easier. Well, what, what, I, so, I think it's so, just one comment on this. I mean, I, I think that, you know, if, if privacy, it, it, any thinking about privacy today is just an illusion and a lack of understanding of technology. I mean, we in security, because of our knowledge, have the ability to create a certain measure of privacy because of what we understand how to do. But in general, it's, it's, it's an illusory thing to think that we even have any. Uh, as general people living in the world, just based on what's out there. I mean, th- there's all of this 
fictitious viewpoint of, you know, <laughs> it's, it's sort of created for us by opt-in or out. But, I mean, to your point, there's this. If you want to read a book that is still relevant today, it was written in the 1990s. Uh, it's a book called The Transparent Society. I don't know if any of you have ever read it. It's by a guy named David Brin. You can actually download it on PDF off of one of the Harvard websites, I think. And uh, he wrote this idea that... Um, you know, there's this uh, trade-off between, um, you know, would you like to live in a world where there's 100% surveillance, but there's, uh, you know, everything is a perfect electronic society, and you have all of the benefits of zero crime and everything, but you're basically exposed and you're naked, you know, from a surveillance perspective, or would you like a complete opt-in type of world where you, you, you choose every point at which your privacy is, is given away, but then you don't have all of the benefits of modern technology. And of course, there is no you know, binary decision in this, as, as you all know, but it, it's an interesting read, and it was written in the 90s, and it's as applicable today as, as it was uh, yeah. in the 90s. I, I mean, my, my, my observation is I think the people that are growing up today have no expectation of privacy, and it's fundamentally different. So I used to work at Microsoft, and we, we used to have um, a set of MIT grads that would come in every year. And I was a, what's called a product unit manager, so I kind of ran a business function, and these, these folks would come in, and these MIT grads, and you get to ask them questions. And a lot of the older people would ask them questions around, like, you know, what can we do? And one, uh, the, the, the kind of stunning response from all of these people was, you should use all of our code to do as much and make my life as best as possible. And all of these people were like shuffling, like feeling really uncomfortable. We can't do that. We can't do that. And they were telling you, I want to use your information. And I, and I think there's this fundamental like difference between the, the notion of, of, of like growing up and having an expectation of privacy and accepting all of these services that aren't. But it feels like if you want to participate in this smart city stuff, you have to give that up and it's not an option, an opt-in. So. Interesting. Or yeah, I should I should call out. as a guy down here in the audience who works for me who has an interesting thing about privacy. He's going to get really embarrassed now, but it's quite funny. So he he is the most privacy aware person that I've ever met. Here he is. Like he's like he's sticking his hand up. So he when I first, when we first started working together, we went on a business trip, and he goes through the scanning, and he won't get scanned. I'm like, dude, like, come on, like, what the fuck is going on? And we start talking about this, and it turns out his house is completely wired. But every night he pulls the USB connectors out. He pulls everything out of the house. And then one day I go into work and I find out he's got Alexa. I'm like, come on, like, what is going on? And it's like, and it's, but it's this trade-off between like functionality and once you get that stuff, everything else gets thrown out the window, right? And yeah, I'm but, sure but the, the Alexa thing. wasn't connected to the internet, so every time he said, "Alexa, what time is it?" Alexa said, "I don't know." Yeah, no, his his his, his was because I asked the question, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so um, so fundamental like technology pieces that are involved in this. So it sounds like driverless cars, like autonomous vehicles, is a is a is a big thing, right? And I would imagine autonomous logistics in general, right? Like all the stuff that we're we're hearing about that's happening, whether it's Hyperloop stuff and like, you know, city to city transportation or things. Um, who are the players that are, in, that, are, that are in this space? I'm imagining like Uber, Tesla, like all of these are the big, are the Schneider big people. Schneider Electric, for example. Schneider Electric? Ele Schneider Electric. Okay. You know, for example, they make traffic lights and uh, control system signaling devices. So, you know, their goal is to uh, tie all the signals together and make systems of systems out of that and link them to. Uh, systems that turn off all of the street lights. Uh, you know, when no cars are going through, all the street lights go out for a while. You know, saving power for, uh, you know, or, or talk to to uh, vehicles and and uh, traffic patterns and, and redirect traffic, things like that. Okay, so any geopolitical kind of concerns around this? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting question because. Uh, Related with what I said before, because when if you're a government, you are acquiring technology, um, you don't really know what's inside the hardware, for instance. You don't know what the, the embedded software is doing. You don't know if that we will capture the data and send it to some place in Russia, China, or the US. Um, so that's a very interesting point when you think about uh, geopolitics um, and say, okay, this technology I'm using, which is from a country which is maybe not very friendly or is well known for spying or whatever, then you need, uh, as, as a government protecting your citizenship uh, and the country, you need to know what software are you running in your cities. And that's something that no one knows right now. It's like you 
practically buy black boxes, you connect them and you use it. And, and that's one of the problems that I, I, I spoke before, that there is no actor that controls all the different elements in our smart city. Like, like Eddie made the example of the body. So at the moment, our smart city have no brain and has, have a, has a lot of little brains, one for each element, but there is no a central brain that can control everything and can put in. For, for putting in a computer engineering perspective, we should have like a proxy or something that know how this system works and how they communicate to each other and, and can put them in communication. At the moment, we have like a dozen of vendors, a dozen of OEM that try to sell their product, smart city buy the products, deploy them, and forgot about them. So, and then next year they buy the new product again, and, and that's over, over, over. So. Yeah, and, and I think to, to, the, to the point that Cesar was making and Matteo as well, you know, the models that, that exist today for testing and validation uh, in general, uh, you know, for example, common criteria, other models like that really are, are not helping us because, you know, they're based on the idea that somehow, you know, for example, for smart cities, there's going to be a protection profile that is somehow applicable to, you know, the kind of vulnerabilities that we're going to find in some box that, you know, we've never seen before that's out there and that, you know, we're magically two years from now going to have a report that says this is okay. You know, so it really does require our community, you know, security researchers, you know, like those of us up here, like yourselves, to take these things, cut them down to bare metal, you know, pull the chips out of them, uh, you know, look at the code and, and really say, how do we find the vulnerabilities in these things that, that really haven't been seen? So, you know, intentional, unintentional, backdoors, bugs, bad implementation of crypto. I mean, you know, to, to your point earlier, you know, so if somebody does an RFP, they say, you know, do you have uh, AES encryption in the box? Yes. <laughs> you know, the real question is, is it done at all in any semblance of uh, correct implementation? You know, do you have authentication? Yes. Well, you know, is it a four character password? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, uh, you know, so I mean, th there's a lot of things that really uh, through, uh, you know, more aggressive testing and validation that can be brought out. And obviously that's not a perfect process either, but it's a lot better than sort of these, uh, these things that we've seen that are generally accepted in our industry, unfortunately. Yeah, and speaking about that, uh, well, last year, um, we spoke about, I, I spoke about in, uh, in GSEC about the um, uh, transportation system hacking that, uh, that we did in the past. So one of the things that we want to brought in the, in the talk was how our methodology to assess the system for the exact same reason. Uh, but during the last year, what we found that is that this methodology is uh, very good if you want to test a single system. But the point in a smart city is that you are not assessing a, a single system usually. So we also need a methodology to understand not only the, the threat on that system, but the threat on the other systems. So even if I take apart this smart traffic sensor that uh, can turn off or on the, the traffic light on the base of the vehicle that's passing under it, uh, I still don't understand how the rest of the system works because the rest of the system First of all, maybe located somewhere else. Their, the backend can be in, in Germany, can be in Russia, can be in wherever the data center is cheaper. And secondly, I'm assessing one of the system that is connecting to three or four other system, and I know nothing about them. So even if I act this, there may be reper repercussion on the other system as well. So I think that as technical guy, I'm, I'm not a high level guy. I won't take decision about the government stuff and all this. I am more a technical guy. So as a technical guy, what we need to do is try to understand what is the best methodology to try to assess the system efficiently. Because we cannot spend like one month for each device and try to, and expect that the industry will follow our time. They, they will publish new devices, they will ship new sensors, they will ship new products without the security in industry uh, in, in mind. So we need a more efficient way to do that and we need to, to have a, a proper communication with the decision maker. All right. So, the government guys at the end. so 
We'll go to the, so anyone, has anyone in the audience got a, got a question? There's not many people drinking beer, which is my question. It's like, why is that the case? But anyway, has anyone got any questions? Because if not, I'm going to ask Eddie one. No one's got any questions at this point. Okay. So, Eddie, imagine you are now evil Eddie. All right? That's a hashtag right there, if someone wants to put that on Twitter. Eddie has just become evil Eddie. What is the worst thing that you would do to a city? So Evil Eddie suddenly says, great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something bad to Singapore. What does it look like? What would you, what would you do and what would the outcome be? Well, you know, I, again, I, I think the, the issue really is, um, about the interdependence. You know, even though we've called out certain cities as leading relative to the smart environment, I don't think that they're, so leading that there's this uh, catastrophic interdependence yet that, that you know that, that could be in the future, but you know having said that, uh, you know I think Matteo brings up both a good and a bad uh, sort of specter. You know, and the specter is that that ultimately in some areas you do need a system of systems to manage you know certain aspects of a smart environment, and just like a lot of these um, you know command and control environments, the concentration of uh, you know that level of control is a very attractive environment for someone to go after uh, because obviously you know that level of control if it's not done uh, properly could give you the keys to the kingdom so if you know if I were to look at something like that you know I would look at as you said you know the the little brains <laughs> that control these different environments or if there was a big brain you know I and I had a lot of time on my hands uh, you know to to basically own it and to just keep that ownership and keep it quietly until I was ready to use it. I mean, that would be, you know, a, an interesting objective. All right, so in practical terms, what would you do? Go after transportation first, go after utilities, go after healthcare, go well, after... Well, it, it depends on your objective. I mean, adversaries have different objectives, you know. I mean, you know, it, it, whether you want to create uh, mass panic and riots and, uh, you know, just chaos and pandemonium, or whether you want to, uh, you know, for example, create, uh, you know, financial turmoil in some way. So it really depends, you know, because cyber terrorists and hacktivists and uh, criminals and others are going to have different objectives. So I think it really just depends on on who's pulling the strings, you know. All right. Cesar, I can't think of a CC at the moment, but I'll think of one in a minute. Malware Mateo we could have, but uh, I can't think of a C. But anyway, all right. What, what would you do? Well, I, I, I can think of a uh, city as uh, making an analogy with a human body. Because you have, you know, the, the sight, you have the, the ears for listening, you have blood, you have the nervous system. So we try to, to, to hack those places. Like, for instance, for the, for the vision, you can attack cameras, CT cameras, you can attack sensors. Um, then from the bloodstream, from the nervous system, you can at attack the traffic control system, the street lighting system. Of course, you, you can go for the power grid and you can hit a lot of more different things, but usually that's something more, more protected and more, uh, with more safeguards. Um, but thinking about in that way, you can just try to have different impact on the city depending on the attack. I mean, like he said, if you can cause, uh, uh, riot panic, maybe you will just shoot down uh, electricity on all the breweries of the city, so there will be a lot of riot probably, people without beer and, and drink. Then well, I, <laughs> in San Francisco, in every couple of years, the, the power, we, we get so much air conditioning gets turned on, the power grids go out sweeping anyway, and there's no riots, but, but yeah, 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 I understand. The, the thing <laughs> with uh, smart city technology is that as an attacker, if you have a lot of different possibilities, and like it's he said there is a lot of different interaction, a lot of dependencies on the system, so you can create a chain reaction by maybe hacking a small city. It ends up being a, a big impact because all the interrelation between the systems. So uh, even for, for an attacker, it's interesting to see how the systems are interrelated and what will happen if you have one system, how that will influence another one. So it's uh, like he said, it's very complex and, and different scenarios that we have that we see usually on corporations or, or regular um, organizations, right? Okay, great. So Mateo, healthcare. So I'd imagine hospitals and pandemics. We've seen bird flu in the in the U.S. sort of spread across the world, and we saw people track it. 
What is, if, if that happened, how would we, in a, in a smart city world, what are the security implications of, of something like that? If a pandemic kicks in, how could, it, how could either a smart city be great or how could it be abused by someone who wants to see something like chemical warfare or pathogens spread in a particular way? Like, what, what would they do? Is there a particular, you know, are we now storing more data? Like, Microsoft have Health Vault, right? Which is basically sort of potentially storing all sorts of interesting information about people. In Beijing, we have the Beijing Genomics Institute, which has 90% of the world's DNA, right? <laughs> these, are, these are very significant data stores of human healthcare stuff. But how would, how's that related to, to, to smart cities? Yeah, at the moment, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But uh, in the future, probably this data will be available to hospitals or, for example, to the services that I spoke before, like Google or whatever. Um, so they imagine uh, uh, Google that can tell you, okay, you are searching for these symptoms, you probably have this disease or something like that. This is something that we couldn't do in the past because we didn't have the uh, computational power, but now we do. Now we're also starting to get more and more data, as you made an example. Um, and since, uh, I think like in other, in other system, all of this stuff will be automated uh, in the future. So I'm, I'm going back to the question of you before. So what system uh, I would attack in, uh, in the case of uh, I want to be the evil actor on a, on, a, on a smart city hack. So since I had time to think about the question, my answer is media probably. Because, um, I don't know, some years ago, I think, I don't remember the exact year, someone hacked some uh, online journal and spread a false notice about uh, some political issue. In in less than 15 minutes, the stock markets drop by like like 50 percent, because all the systems that are actually taking care of this are algorithms. Algorithms read the journal information and acts accordingly. So that means that probably acting on the media or the the, the data sources that spread most of the information. So also social networks and stuff like this. If I can spread. Uh, the, the kind of information that I want on this on this uh, media, I can probably trigger the most of the system in a future of in the smart city of the future. So most of the system will take care of this. Also, let's see the example of before with the. Oh, let's take another example. Let's take Google. Google Maps use uh, information from Android phones and people using Google Maps to track traffic, right? So if I can fake this kind of uh, data sources, I can affect. All, all people use Google Maps, like from normal people to drivers to Uber drivers, anyone. And probably also like uh, we, we did some research in the past against the smart garbage system. So that basically they are sensor that detects if a garbage bin is full and they act automatically calls the, the, the truck to take. And all of these use Google Maps APIs. And that's another example of what I said before so that our smart city will integrate third-party systems. So, yeah, probably source of information for the for the whole ecosystem. Okay, good. So we must now. Now, surely the audience has thought of a great question. If not, Alex is going to have a great question because he's been put on the spot. Come on, someone must have a great question. Uh, well, I don't have a question. Yeah, just throw the throw the microphone in his yeah, face, exactly. and he has no, no and he has no choice, right? Yeah, well he's done, just Amy. Sing instead. Yeah. Um, no, so I, well, yeah, when I think of smart cities, I, I think about it's more of, an, of a big organic distributed system. And I question if it's even possible to secure it because of the nature of the organic distributed systems where multiple devices just join the network or dejoin the network. And it's almost impossible to control all of these, right? So instead of controlling the, um, you know, trying to control the actual devices, like, is it better to have active system that can monitor and, and police and take actions? So active controls, for example. So I don't know what you guys think about that, but uh, that's, that's kind of how I think about it. So to, so to re restate the question, there's, a, there's two models. One is you can figure out how to try and secure it internally, or the other one is you can trust but verify, Mon or monitor but verify. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, isn't that the same thing? I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, look, you know, we pretty much fail at everything, you know, from a security <laughs> perspective. So, I mean, I think um, 
there has to be a measure of both, right? I, I think you have to set up some objectives from a security perspective and then monitor the shit out of it. Um, you know, so yes, both <laughs> is the answer. I have no question but a peer. A German person, privacy, yes. come on, yes. Yeah, yeah let's look to Turkey uh, and um, smart nation and... Um, Turkey? Yeah, let's say Turkey and right. uh, Mr. Erdogan. This is going to get political very quickly. Yeah. So if you don't follow the world stage, Erdogan yeah. recently accused look. Angela Merkel of being evil. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, oh, however. <laughs> all right, come on, let's get the question. <laughs> However, my fears, uh, when a nation goes rogue, uh, then... Uh, hey, I live in America, I have to yeah. deal with Donald Trump. Your, yeah, problems, yeah. your problems are nothing compared to mine, trust me. <laughs> and you are from UK, and you're I'm the from Brexit. the UK, I know. And I live where we have a clown for a president, what can I say? Anyway, yeah. oh, I but guess it's being live-streamed, I'm sorry. The, the problem is when the clown goes on a witch hunt. Well, yes. Anyway, yes. Okay, so what's the question? Yeah. What do you say to, to uh, someone uh, like me that's in fear of the nation goes rogue and, uh, yeah, doing a witch hunt and in a smart city or a smart nation, you are an easy target because they know so much uh, about you. Who wants to take that? I have no idea how I would possibly answer that personally. Can, can, you, can you repeat the so question? The question so the question, yeah. So, so uh, let me. I'll try and summarize it and say. So um, Germans obviously are very uh, privacy aware and very privacy conscious. And uh, how would you say, what, how would you talk to a German citizen um, when you have potential rogue nations such as Turkey, for instance, and now got a beef against the, the Germany? And there's the now you know potential a lot of data and a lot of things that could be attacked against the German. German people. So my, my first answer is a question. I mean, uh, what do you mean with going raw? I mean, rogue, rogue, rogue. Yeah, sorry. What I, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, um, half of the citizens are uh, under uh, terror uh, investigation, and uh, uh, yeah. Most of the press is getting. Uh, uh, well, to be fair and it, well, to be and fair and impartial, I don't think half of the Turkish population are under terror investigations, but just. So no, well, I think that uh, well, I don't live in Turkey, so I don't know about the Turkish situation. But from a perspective of a Italian guy that has not this big issue, uh, I say that at the moment most of the modern country are not looking to harm citizen. I mean. They probably want to control them, but the final aim of a, of a liberal country is to provide uh, wel welfare to the, to the people. So, actually, I, I don't know how to answer your question because I don't see a scenario in the modern countries in which the government should use this information to go against the normal people, against the, the people that go to office every day and Beside controlling them to provide them more welfare, I mean. So I think the scenario. It sounds, it so, sounds like, yeah. like so I think the scenario was it's not necessarily the German government are going to use that data against them, but it may be Pyongyang are going to suddenly decide that the that there's a huge population of a huge uh, bank of information. That's four. That's very uh -huh. naughty. So, so uh, the question is not how did the government turn on but, but its, its own city? Right, but, but once you have a data bank of, of information, can foreign governments then use that in a geopolitical situation? I think that's the I think, I think we're a bit off track, but uh, just, to, just to be clear, I mean, if any of you are on the internet and you see advertising, uh, Google, Facebook, et cetera, have a lot more information than anyone else has. I mean, the governments wish they had the information that the walled gardens have. So uh, and that's it, why it, the government going to use those providers for information. They want it, but yeah. I'm just saying. I mean, so that's really where the data is. I I, I sure wish I, as a, a cyber intel analyst, sometimes had access to that information. Because boy, there's some great stuff there. Is, is that is strategically is that why Google are playing in the autonomous vehicle space? Like they're investing. I don't know. I don't work at Google. But you, okay. So so you know, you're, you're smirking into your beer, Adam. Like they they must they, they must have they must have some like 
like logistics is clearly very important, right? And logistics of, of vehicles is one thing, but logistics of things like shipping and all of these other things is also very important, right? So how do, how do they play in that world? Like Google have a huge amount of data. Other companies have a huge amount of data. Like what's their, what's their role in this smart city future? In the I, I don't want to speak about Google because, I, again, I don't work for Google. But uh, no, I mean, you know, that uh, you can speak about them if you want to talk about them one way or another. I mean, the, but you mentioned uh, machine to machine communications, and that is a big part of smart city. I mean, certainly the idea that, um, you know, we can track chain of custody of goods and we can track it moving through the city and have a better idea of what's moving through the city and when and so on based on integration of different technologies. Some of them have been around for a long time. Some of them are emerging. Uh, it becomes particularly interesting when you start putting it on the blockchain because as you know, as we see blockchain emerging as the fifth wave of technology and we see the integration of logistic systems into the blockchain and integration of blockchain into this, I, I do see benefits relative to non-repudiation of supply chain events. Obviously, we have to solve the, the PKI issue that currently exists there you know, in a post-quantum world, but having said that, uh, you know, there are some inter interesting applications there. So explain that to me, because I'm the, I'm the dumb guy. The blockchain, how does that affect logistics? What, what's well, that? Uh, you know, the idea of a non-repudiable ledger for supply chain management. And as you're moving goods through, you know, from port or from, you know, origin, manufacturer of origin to final destination, let's say, in the city, the idea that you can have a non-repudiable chain of custody uh, is very, very interesting from the, the moment that, a, that something's created in a factory to the moment it's received by somebody. And, you know, think of that on a much larger scale. Uh, you know, and, and that same uh, registry could, could serve a lot of different purposes in a smart city environment. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of cryptographic principles and, and other problems that need to be resolved in blockchain before we can, you know, think of, of that, you know, that level of application deployment on top of the various th systems that we have today. So. And again, we have privacy issue. All right, we have another question. Yep, hi, so. Um, where are you from? Where am I from? Yeah. From the US. Okay, good. <laughs> I hope you didn't vote for Donald Trump, but apart from that, good. <laughs> um, you did it, vote for Donald it's, Trump, it's because you didn't deny it, did you? <laughs> Shame on you. Anyway, okay, carry on. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm taking this vacation as an opportunity to step away from the American political realm. Well I'm done. So deeply immersed in. Well done. Yeah, thank you for helping so, save the world from so, that. So clown. thank you for, for trying to drag me back home just there. Right. Um, <laughs> no, so I was hoping you could maybe provide some context and insight around how much municipal groups and the people who would be purchasing to develop smart cities uh, are aware of security issues and how much the security of these systems enters the equation when they're selecting vendors, selecting products that they're going to bring into their environment. Is this something that, that gets discussed? Is, is there awareness from, from the municipal purchasing side? Um, and I guess to wrap up, are there any, uh, I guess, positive examples that you've seen that you could, you could highlight? Yeah, that's a great question. I was actually, I was actually interested in that. When someone was talking, when you, when you guys were talking earlier, I was thinking about when you sell to the US government FIPS 140, you have to make sure that your devices are compliant and there's a whole set of things. Is there any kind of like the follow on question to that? Is there any work around defining what those standards are and making sure people, you know, adhere to them, vendors adhere to them? I, I don't understand what the question. Can you, can you restate it? Yeah, why don't you restate it? Yeah, so, so in working with, with municipal groups and smart city city organizations, is there awareness of security to the point where it enters the conversation when they're selecting vendors and making purchasing decisions? Is is it influencing no. action? No, I don't think so. Usually, because government don't understand security. I mean, the people in charge of security are not the ones uh, taking decision or selecting the vendors. So it's basically sometimes are a lot related with politics or with approved vendors or who is the one to purchase for because of what. You know, it depends on the country. On my country, there is a lot of corruption. So you buy the one 
which give you more money back to you as a politician. Um, but in, in other places, it's basically they have a list of vendors and they do uh, functionality testing. They say, okay, this works better, it's cheaper, let's buy this, and that's it. There is, uh, I haven't seen anyone worried about security. Of, if they worry about security, the vendor will say, yeah, yes, yeah, we, we, are, we are secure. Uh, and that's it, there is no, no way to enforce the vendor for, for being compliant with some security basic. I, I haven't seen that yet. Um, I think that raises another question that may be more important, is who is, the, who is liable if some accident happens? I mean, if the government buys some equipment that is insecure and some attacks happen and we see a, a victim, a, a people who die, who is liable for, for this, this action? I mean, there, there should be some regulation that can prevent or at least identify the liable actor in, in, in this situation. I, and I, at the moment, I think there is no. So that, that's one of the, I, I, I have no answer about this, but that's one of the questions that when we, when the, the rare times that we can speak with people that make decision, we usually ask them and, and mm. they, they don't know. Yeah. Um, so um, to your question, uh, in Dubai, for example, um, the uh, smart Dubai government actually is thinking about um, the underpinnings relative to security. So the, you know, they, they understand that there's some building blocks needed to, uh, you know, as enablers for that. You know, like I mentioned blockchain, there's an initiative to blockchain uh, certain government services by 2020. There's a initiatives around PKI and post-quantum crypto. Uh, so, uh, and that's been publicly announced and, and so on, and there's public tenders in these areas. So um, you have to have these building blocks in place uh, if you want to then build, uh, you know, the ecosystem that we're talking about. In the US, um, there are smart city councils that are starting to get groups of, of municipalities together to talk about how to do different aspects of smart city. And there is a security dimension in the smart city councils in the US. Uh, I know this because I was on the board of ISACA and we got involved in that. Um, now, how mature is that today? It's not that mature. But at least they're talking to each other and at least there's the notion that, okay, there's all these vendors that want to participate and there's municipalities that are not very mature in terms of their procurement process, but they want to do it. And uh, hopefully, you know, they'll come together and they'll get the right advisors and something good will come out the other end of it. But, you know, as, as usual, the first, the first people to the table are probably going to learn the lessons the hard way. So, yeah. uh, Something interesting to consider is that, you know, for smart cities, there is government behind. So there is many things related specifically to government you don't see on companies. And, what, and, and also with politics. One thing... Uh, it's important to have in mind is that security is invisible. Um, for politics, that doesn't add much value because you can say, okay, I will spend $100 million securing all the city infrastructure. Um, people won't see that. They won't get more votes for the politicians. It's different than say, okay, we are spending $100 million building a new bridge, so you will get to back from work to home very quickly. You will spend more time with your family. You will be happier. People say, oh, yes, that's nice. Let's vote for this guy the next round. Um, so that's something concrete and visible. But security is invisible. So I think that until there aren't, um, uh, how do you say, uh, regular attacks on cities related with the technology they use, mostly there won't be much investment on the security area. Unless there are some places like uh, Dubai or other places that politics doesn't work that way because they are ruled in different way. But in general, when you think about politics and how invisible security is, until we don't see much attacks, things won't change, I think. Hillary Clinton and her email server may disagree with you about politics, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, observation that I, I guess, and, and, and maybe just trying to summarize, it feels like all these purchasing decisions around smart cities are made by regional government. And I think, you know, my experience of that has been central government generally has a sophisticated approach to security and regional government a non-sophisticated approach. Is that a, 
Is that an oversimplification of things? Are we, are we basically kind of the, the, the smart city is put into a regional context and that's part of the problem or not? No response from any. Like, like if, 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 so, so, so my, my experience of, of government has been around the world in general and an overgeneralization is that central governments are very sophisticated around security in general, right? They're all running intelligence agencies. They're running very large pieces of data. But generally, regional governments are less sophisticated. And that's just the nature of what, what, they're, what they're doing. It sounds like the distributed nature of smart city dis security decisions are being made on a regional basis. Is that part of the problem? So if this thing was started to become centralized and started to become regulated, the, we, we may see an increased security or not? I, I don't know that that's true, uh, actually. I mean, I, I, you look at uh, large cities uh, with, that have a large tax base, like London or New York and so on. Uh, they certainly have the muscle to do this if they want to. But I mean, to, you know, to Cesar's point, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't give you votes, and uh, you know, doesn't it may or may not create jobs that are visible. So uh, you know, or doesn't keep the trains on the tracks. So you, you know, I, I think. I think there are a lot of uh, factors that, that, that come into these decisions. And it's also possible for a medium-sized city that is very, very well run, that has a decent tax base to do a good job with this with the right advisory. So I don't, I don't think there's that correlation that you're, you're stating. OK, good. Yeah. We, got, we got a few minutes left, and we got another question. All right. well, Jim. It's not, all right, all right. Uh, it's not really a question because uh, my question is already answered. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is like uh, making a suggestion because I'm coming from the third world country where the first world is always our role model. So what you guys doing in Germany, in USA, UK, is like we are looking up. So uh, what we're looking right now is the, a good model that we can implement, copy, or whatever, like choosing the right vendor, whether like security tested, we can do to, to, to have everything properly and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know, uh, probably it's like, Mark, you personally done great with OOPS back in the days, and probably you can do the same thing with the smart city and making some new standard now, how the security testing for the smart city solution and stuff like that. I don't know, AD, CSR? What? What do you mean about? Well, so, I think, so I think Jim's question. I think Jim, what Jim is saying is, is someone going to take the charge and uh, expose or or uh, champion what the problem is and figure out how to create standards around this? So who's who's leading well, who's leading that charge and who, who, well, should, we, who should you attach to? We are doing some efforts with Securing Smart Cities Initiative, where after identifying all these issues and, and all the problems, I thought. Okay, we, I should do something about this, not only complaining and pointing out the problems. Sure. I try to find solutions and, right. and offer something. So I talked to people, uh, friends and companies, and there was a lot of interested people, and, and we started to work on that. So we have created the guidelines. We are publishing papers. Um, because something to, to know about is that there are much resources related specifically to cybersecurity in smart cities. There isn't... You can find cybersecurity about any topic, but for smart cities, it's a very re re reduced amount of information. Totally. So one thing we are doing is creating that information, making it easy to understand for general public, not only for technical people, but only for decision makers, for government people that can take you know a five-page paper and understand the problem and try to do something about that. Oh, we are a few people. We are trying to do something. Um, we haven't done much, but... We, we are working on that. Cesar, where, where would people go to find out that information? Yeah. Uh, SecuritySmartCities.org. And there are a lot of useful papers there. And we have companies and researchers collaborating. And once in a while, we release a, a paper, uh, some research that is very interesting. Because, like I said, we try to focus on practical uh, and simple things that can be understood by anyone. I don't know if I can say that, but we are also working on, on a training, right? Right now, there is a project inside the, 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 the initiative for training uh, like high-level people on, on these issues. I mean, nice. the training will be divided, but there is also a part for high-level people to, yeah. to understand better the, the issue. And actually, the, the initiative last year in uh, DEFCON, 
we also got some some response from government people that were present, some people from the government that like asked questions and try to stay in I don't know if they try to stay in contact later, but at least they participate during the, the talk of last year. Yeah, right. Also having this panel, you know, helps to yeah. to to share ideas to ideas um, and to uh, to bring the, the problems to the table and trying to find solutions. I mean, we are at early stage, uh, but we should start do doing something right now because when in a few years, when there will be really smart cities, you know, a lot of technology being deployed, everything integrated, any cyber attack, if the technology is not secure, there will be a huge impact on how we live and how it will affect our lives. Great. So we are at the end. Any other burning questions from the audience? I don't see anyone. We're not going to pay. I won't. Oh, we have one more here. Great. Where, where are you from and what's your question? I'm from Singapore. Excellent. Um, you, didn't vote for, you didn't vote for Donald Trump. Great. I didn't. I didn't. I was well disappointed. Done. As, well done, as you. As you. Yes. <laughs> anyway, we're not going to turn this into a Trump festival. Yeah. Yep. So I'm just curious, um, smart nation, smart city. It all talks about government. I see four guys up there, not from government. Um, so maybe we are missing an important element in we, the discussion. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. We ask yes. about having government people from Singapore. And I don't know what was the reaction. I think Dylan will know, but... We asked a couple of months ago to participate in this uh, in this roundtable to Singapore government. Yeah, usually people from government don't want to to talk on the record. Well, I think I heard you just now that you say that they probably don't know much. That's why they don't have any much to say. I, but they have the power to, to, to put on regulations, to enforce, to put in money on this. So maybe I'm just wondering uh, what is the top three things on your list that you want the government to do? Yeah, so just to be clear, I... I, I certainly didn't say that government people don't know much. Uh, the government people I work with know a lot, <laughs> number one. And I've been, I've had 20 plus years involved with the government and my current job involves a lot of government people. So, uh, you know, I, I've worked for a long, long time as a government contractor. So I think the way I would, I would think about it is that, you know, while, you know, and I know my colleagues have as well, you know, while certainly we're not government executives, I, having worked so closely with the government for so many years of my career, I certainly have a perspective on the way the government thinks. Now, you know, having a government rep up here to tell you what, you know, what regulations they're thinking about and how they view procurements and how they view the vendor landscape, I agree is a lot different perspective than hearing vendors speak about it. But I'll tell you that you know, my life is daily interaction with city officials, federal officials, and so on, listening to them talk about their vision, listening to them talk about how they view this space, the things that keep them up at night, the dreams they have about making you know, people's lives better. So you know, I, I don't think you're getting a skewed perspective, because we're not here selling you anything as much as trying to tell you that, that you know, we're reflecting the viewpoints of the people that we, we talk to in our daily lives. You know? So it, it's, not, it's not that far off. Uh, you know, you're going to hear a different version if, if we were the actual government people. Y yes, I, I work with government too, and, and I know yeah. that they, they actually know quite a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's I just agree like law is classified. So. Yeah, I agree with you. So. Yeah. But, um, so, maybe that's, so maybe that's a great way to kind of end, actually. So the question was three things, but we're not going to get three things from everyone. But if you get one wish that you could ask every government around the world, whether it's testing, regulation, driving standards into vendors, Whatever, whatever that thing is, you each get one wish. What is it? And we'll start with you at the end, Eddie, and we'll work backwards. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, my one wish would be, you know, what I'm seeing uh, a lot of in Dubai, you know, I see that across a lot of municipalities, which, you know, which would be to think about the, the plumbing first. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, and, and this is not a bad thing. It's, it's just what's happened, and, and it's fine. But, uh, you know, we rush to all the cool stuff first, and then it's like, oh, you security guys come in, you security men and women come in and fix all this stuff for us. And, uh, you know, I, I think what we're seeing with a lot of this is the, a healthy fear of what could happen if it's not done right. 
And uh, a, a lot of it involves good plumbing. And uh, you know, so I'd like to see the plumbing done right. That would be my wish. Okay, great. Cesar. For me, I think uh, the fair thing to do is education. Because people know, need to understand, they need to know first what is security about, what is important to, to have security, because if, if they don't know about it, they, they won't do anything. So I think education is the main thing. People should be educated, uh, officials at the government at different level, from technical to high level people, they need to understand that now we depend a lot of technology and we need to protect it. Because if we don't protect it, then we won't be able to have uh, a regular life like we have today. And this technology dependence keep growing every day. So every day, security, protecting this technology it becomes also more, more important. So they need to learn that. They need to understand that. And from there, I think they will understand that they have to do something about it. Okay, great. So plumbing, education and awareness. Yeah, I think we can, we can summarize all of this with uh, interaction and involvement with the security community, community and, and security researcher. I think that that's the ultimate answer to let them understand the problem and try to, to anticipate the bad things. Great. So fantastic. It sounds like your resource is a brilliant resource for people to start with. So can you just repeat that? Because I know this is being streamed. So what's the URL of that? Securing the smart cities.org. There is a lot of uh, securing the there is a lot of information there, papers, guidelines, and there is an email there you can use to contact us. If you want to join and collaborate, you're welcome. Great. We may put the link in the YouTube video description. Yep. Something possible. Down Great. there, down there, I think, is what you say with YouTube, right? <laughs> Sorry. Down there if you need to comment. Great. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. It was a great inauguration for the pub, right? Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.